What's your approach to live performance and electronic music in general? You know, when I first started making electronic music, there really wasn't, there was no rule book. There was no, you know, education, things like this. We just had to make it up. Um, and even the synthesizers I was buying were mostly used. They didn't come with manuals. Uh, when I first got my first things and it said MIDI or sync or CV, I had no idea what it was talking about. There was no internet. So I just kind of plugged things in and tried to find a way through the machines. So that's kind of how I still work. This isn't actually my normal setup. It's the foundation of my normal setup, but we've added a couple of things, which 10 days ago when we started this tour, I was like, okay, I can't wait. I want to use this and that and that. And by the end of the tour, I'm going to have a, a kind of a new setup, but it's been so busy talking and, 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 and doing the, the, the travels and really having some incredible discussions. There actually hasn't been as much time that I thought to actually just sit with my equipment. So we're going to sit with my equipment today and, and try some things out. Yeah, and across the whole tour, we've had some amazing discussions, like you mentioned. One of the things that really stood out was a quote from you where you said um, you loved, back in the day when you first started going to clubs, being surrounded by frequencies and losing yourself in the music. Um, how much of how you play now is affected by, the, by just being surrounded by music and not necessarily going from one track to the other? Yeah. Um, you know, for those who didn't know, don't know, I came up a long time ago, um, around 25 years ago. I was like 17, 18, going to clubs in Detroit, watching people like Derek May and listening to people on the radio like Jeff Mills. And all of these DJs were, I said this yesterday, I don't know if they were disrespectful for the music they were playing um, or, or what their thinking was, but they didn't care if they just really fucked with the music they were playing. You know, so when I went to see Derek, he was grabbing the EQ and taking the, the lows out and bringing the highs up. And then suddenly this, the whole song just became tss, And then when it kicked back in, it was an, an incredible moment. And maybe that sounds, you know, that's commonplace now. But at that moment, nobody else, hardly anybody else on the planet was really deconstructing or destroying and reconstructing music like that. You know, so you had Derek, you had Kevin doing that, you had a great club called the Music Institute where you went and there was a tape machine running next to the turntables. And on that tape machine was brand new music that had just been created at the studio. And then maybe there was an 808 drum machine, you know, like I have a drum machine up here. This is kind of a, the new version of the 808. But even then, 25 years ago, they were, you know, mixing it, you know, one hand on the turntable, one on the drum machine. Um, and so, yeah, it was just like, it wasn't really, of course it was about playing great music and putting two records together, but everyone I watched was doing more than that. And I remember getting my first and a residency at the shelter downtown in Detroit. And even then I had a Newmark mixer. Um, I don't remember how I plugged it in, but I had a little half rack boss delay. So sometimes when I was playing, I would turn the delay on and turn the, 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 the delay time really tight, which became kind of a flanger and it's suddenly the, the kind of the normal house track or inner city, you know, a nice vocal track, everyone's jamming and suddenly it'd be like and totally getting turned inside out. And most places, as I, as I started traveling around to Europe and other places, I then noticed how, I guess I could say radical, this Detroit style was. Also Chicago and stuff, but, you know, I think, to, you know, where, where you know, I, I didn't grow up in the other places, so maybe I'm wrong, but from my perspective, you had, you know, Chicago was really dis somehow based on, and had a connection to disco and more soul from, from, um, uh, from New York, and, and perhaps they, they like to play their music a little bit longer, but, but Detroit, it was the home place of techno. It was like, use these machines, bang it, you know, go from the studio, go to the, uh, go to the club. And it was just, it was like that. So later, Dex Effects 909 and this way of DJing came. But this is just an extension of exactly how I played 25 years ago. And it's just been slowly stepping my way through, adding things, taking away, learning and trying to fuck with records as much as possible. <laughs> well, where, where do you think that experimentation came from in Detroit? 
But it's also like, you know, I used to be on the, you know, um, many times uh, on the dance floor listening to these guys. And um, at the end of the day, even more so now, everybody can get the same records, you know. Then maybe someone had the, the special white label, everyone had their secrets, they, you know, would cover the records, and you're like, what are they playing? And you're like, fuck, you know, it, was, it was erased it. Or sometimes you'd take a little piece of paper, and as you played the record, you'd put it on top so nobody could see what you're playing. <laughs> so, like, really, really secret stuff. But, you know, so that time's gone a little bit. But what was more important of that is, like, if you were going to play a record, and especially a record that everybody else was playing, then, you know, of course it's about the record, but it's about you, too. It's about your personality. So you've got to got to put yourself through that. And, 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 and every time I was on the dance floor listening to those, those guys, they would play something, I'd be like, oh, I love this record. And I would be like, actually, that's not that record. What is this record? And then it was like that classic thing that people talk about, that magic moment where the, you know, who says this, Eddie folks, the third record, the third record that doesn't exist. And that magic moment always was what I was waiting for, whether I'm DJing or live or we're doing an enter show with different rooms, it all boils down to creating a sonic structural experience that is about that moment, which perhaps in the best possible way would never happen again. Have you been waiting for this technology to come? Or have you just been adapting as the technology advances? Um, I think it's just been adapting and, and I think it's always waiting. There's always something that you want to do that you can't do. Um, well, we just ho hooked this, 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 this uh, drum machine in, which is really nice. Uh, you know, I'm using push for drums and things like that, but I like tactile control. So right now, a lot of instruments are coming back out, which are really live machines, and you can really get in there and, 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 and perform live. So I think that's, actually, that's kind of what I'm looking for all the time. The most cohesive things right now are hardware boxes. You know, that's why everyone's getting into them again. You got this does one thing or a couple of things, buttons are there, everyone's thought about it, and turn it on and you know what it does. And that simplicity is incredible for me. It's like the Allen and Heath mixer. You know, I know all these buttons on it, and, and it, 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 it's super functional. But when you go into the plug-in world, which I would love to use more, I would love to actually move more into the digital world of DJing, because I'm still, it's still a hybrid here. But once you go into that world, then you have to start finding generic controllers and assigning things. And through that, perhaps you find some kind of cool customization, but there's a lot of work involved. And sometimes all that time spent setting up for that moment of creativity takes away from the creativity and can actually even derail you. So I'm, I'm a fan of putting a lot of boxes together that, that work really quickly together, that are kind of simple, and that just allow me to get in there and play. Yeah, and there's, there's more and more coming in the market now. And the best thing is they're really affordable also, so everyone can just sling them out, open up track through. Yeah, so, you know, affordability set. was in a way always there. Um, you know, someone was asking me earlier, you know, we were talking, like, did you have a, a Profit 5? No, because even, even in 1992 or whatever, the Profit 5 was $1,000 or $1,500, like, cheaper than it is now, but still unattainable for me. So I was just using boxes that cost me 50 bucks or 250. So I was using Roland 101s and not like a big system 100 modular because it was cheap. And put it all together and I had fun. That's what Dave Smith, uh, synthesizer designer, said to us yesterday. He wants to make instruments that people have fun with. They sit there and they start smiling and maybe even laughing. Oh my God, what kind of sound is this? I kind of want to do that when I'm playing, like, oh my god, this is great, oh, what the fuck, like, <laughs> like if I'm doing that, like, it, it, you know, like, a lot of you guys or girls are, like, on the dance floor dancing, and a lot of you are looking up, right, so, like, um, sometimes it would be good to not look down and just take it all in, but if you're looking up and that person is having fun and animated and, you know, not just this, but, like, just doing something, <laughs> then, uh, then, uh, but... <laughs> Someone could have a wireless controller and actually be doing something, but prob <laughs> probably not, probably not. But anyway, the point is, like, if that person who's being creative, you know, if you can tell they're into it, you know, they may not even be looking at you, but they're really into it and doing something, this connection really brings us tighter together, even without eye contact. And 
that creates some kind of dynamics. So with that in mind, so maybe we should start making some noise with these things? Okay, well, so I, I use Tractor because I like having the ability to play a lot of things on top of each other. Um, I do play one track by itself sometimes if it's set up in the right way. Uh, but like I just explained, I like to, to play with things. I also run Ableton in the background for, for drums. Um, of course, you can sync all this stuff together. There's always this question, oh, okay, all your tracks are synced. You press start and you press the sync button and everything's aligned. But it's actually not completely true because um, the computer analyzes everything, but everything's a little bit out. Uh, and you can spend all the time you know, on the plane or before the gig putting everything perfect. But one, that's really boring. Two, I'm a bit lazy. So I kind of just leave, I let the computer try to figure out everything. And, and, and it's pretty close, and, and I just kind of leave it. But, so when I play each track, they are kind of in line, but I kind of have to push and pull. pull. Uh, so I have some buttons here, and it's nearly the same as speeding up and slowing down a turntable. So there is some kind of human intervention going in there. And then when you're running a program like Tractor, which has its clock, and then Ableton, which is in front here, with its clock, you can also just say, hey, sync that shit together, and when you press start on one, it all works together. But it's also maybe, when it's on, it's on, but that can also get boring. So I leave them separated, and then once I start one, I just press space bar on the other, and I, again, have a couple of buttons here that I speed it up, slow it down, until it's in time. And it's never in perfectly time, and sometimes it's going off, and sometimes it can sound a bit sloppy. But then you bring it back, and, and somehow I like it. It gives me some things that I'm doing. I feel more connected to what I'm doing. I feel that I'm, you know, what we talk about a lot, that I'm in control, and it's not just the computer in control. And, and that gives a little bit more of the, the humanity back to the mix. So if I was, what I'll do, I'll kind of play how I would be listening. You wouldn't hear this normally if you're in, in the crowd. So maybe I, I would have this thing going, you know, and then then I would start the clap. You wouldn't be hearing this. I'd be like, oh, okay, that's, I think everybody can tell that's not completely on, right? <laughs> so if you think it's on, I don't think you're going to be a good DJ. <laughs> so I have like a couple of buttons. Okay, here, here. And this is basically like just pitching up. So I'll just do it extreme, so. Yeah, no, it's kind of on now, so. So now that's on. And now, now I don't have to touch it. Now those things are in sync, but it's not a computer sync. I did the sync, so if it's a little bit, that gives a kind of a, maybe, I don't know, a hot and groove or, or something like that. And what you can also do is maybe put it off, and maybe it gives a nice rhythm for certain tracks. See, now it's a little bit before. It doesn't make so much sense now, but, you know, when you're in the mix and everything's going, sometimes it's like it's building this tension, which I do a lot in my tracks. If you watch the next thing, we'll talk about production and we'll talk about that again. And then maybe I'm bringing it back. There we go, we're tighter again. So that's all going on. And at um, the same time, you've got you know, something else going. And as you see, those things just came on time. The computer did its an analysis really well, and I don't have to worry about that. But maybe, yeah, maybe it's not perfect, so you can hear me kind of phasing it in and out of time now. Now it's not so good. And now it's cool. You know, starting to flange on top of each other. So all these things are going on. I've got four things. I've got the drum machine, and it's like, okay, push over here, pull over here. And some, sometimes it gets really annoying, but I know. Like, I, I try to explain that when I'm playing, I'm, you know, we're supposed to be all together. So as I'm hearing something kind of creep, you guys are feeling it. And 
you know, we're, we're, we're on that edge. If it was all like one, two, three, four, like it would be so boring. You know, I mean, all 16 bars, here comes the clap, here comes this. So I'm doing a lot of stuff, which is um, when I'm playing, it's like you know, taking it out and then like instead of kicking it in there, I'll kick it like whatever on the second or the two, you know, instead of the one. So all the things that normally, everything is so grid, you know, like all the timing in Tractor or Ableton or Logic or Pro Tools, it's like you put your grid on, you're in your arrangement window, you're telling this to make a four bar loop or a two bar loop, like why the fuck can't you make a three bar loop or like a four note loop? Like that's, that's cool shit, you know, you guys probably heard records, you probably don't even need, know, but you're listening and someone's playing and it's cycling and you start forgetting where the one, two, three is. It's like things are going 12 bars or 13 bars and there's a couple of lines and it's all, and you're totally, it's totally hypnotic. But a lot of these tools, they still, they're not built that way. So you can't let, that's why you can't let those tools control you and take that humanity or kind of randomness out of you. Uh, I got a really cool thing under here that nobody knows. Uh, this, is my, this is my foot pedal. I don't know why after 10 or 15 years of using a foot pedal that nobody else does it. Yeah, yeah. Actually, I think Chris may do it, but this allows me to control some of my effects. Just gives me a third hand. See this little feedback thing here? You see that moving up there? So that's controlled by the foot pedal. And for those who don't know, feedback, if that's right up and I take a delay, it just keeps the delay going for nearly ever. So you can imagine, I've got a couple tracks going, everything is building up, I grab a little bongo. Let me put that up. So I can keep that going and not worry about my hands. And then when I hit the foot pedal right before it kicks in, it's gone. And then it's just like massive power. So that's, um, you know, I keep thinking about having a couple, you know, and that would be really, really interesting too, maybe for reverb time. So, um, and that, that's really the, that's been with me since anyone who knows the Dex FX 909 album in like 1998, 1997, which is kind of the beginning of, I think, of the big push of equipment on, and, and on records and effects. Um, without that, I wouldn't be able to do those records. So. One of the things I'm interested in right now with this Roland device, it adds a little bit more variety and possibilities. But if I'm on this machine and I'm putting like just some rides over top and maybe one bongo that I can detune, I'm starting to get a little bit more possibilities to building tension. But then I go to this device and maybe I can put three or four things going on at once and start tuning two things at once. Mm -hmm. Of course, you may be gonna get to a point where there's too much, but for those who know my plastic man material, which is built up on very small parts and a lot of toms and snares, that's kind of how I work in the studio. So right now I've been using these controllers here, which I've been using for a long time. Um, the kind of custom map, these are the Tractor X, X1s? I forget. Oh yeah, X1 right here. <laughs> um, and um, each one of those is controlling one of the different turntables. So I can add effects. I can change the loop size. And then do uh, uh. I have a way to just, you know, jump through there really quick, find, I'm like, okay, that sounds like a good part. Let's, let's start there. And then, you know, build from there. So what they don't have is a way to kind of really search through your music. Uh, you can assign some of the controls, but you're still going to end up looking at the screen. Um, I hate computers in a DJ booth. Because <laughs> uh, most people, you know, this is actually the worst setup ever. This right here, I told all my guys on Minus two things. Cover, you know, there's this great company called um, Nuvango, or it used to be called Jelly Skins. And... Um, you can go there, you can order this, like shameless promotion if you want, you know, $19.99 or something like that, whatever. But cover that stuff, and if you're gonna have a computer, this is just because of the, the room, 
I always have it at a 45 degree or even more. So you just kind of see this. You can see the computer, but it's not like a slap in the face. Um, so I really stress to try and find a, a better way, you know, because you, you don't want anything obscuring the view of what you're doing. And, um, I, you know, I don't think a computer is a cool look in, 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 on a DJ booth. So I'm doing a bit of experimenting right now. I just found this great app called um, Duet Display. So you can plug your iPad in, and it becomes a, like a super fast, because it's not, a, it's not air, AirPlay. Yeah, because that's not fast enough. So you plug it in. And I'm just experimenting now having the computer over here and having a little iPad here with a, a mirror. So that as I'm playing, I can see what's going on, and I can go over here. And I think that will be a nice little development. But another interesting development right now are these D2s. What you can do with these, uh, among other things, you've got this beautiful screen. You can go in here. So you can also find your tracks and load it, and then do everything I was doing on the other controller. If you have the right file inside, which is called a stem file, Native Instruments have created this open format finally, um, and um, put more music in there. So there's four extra stereo files which break the song apart into four components. Why that is a really interesting development, you know, is because, you know, normally you're playing tracks and I've got drum machines on top, but isn't it exciting that, you know, when you, you have, a, have a song and then you're like, man, this is great, but I don't need this clap right now, and you can just pull, pull that clap right out. Or you're like, man, that, you know, I love Kevin Saunderson's records. He's got these great hi-hats. I'm like, but can I just like, no offense to Kevin, can I just erase all the other stuff right now? I don't want to hear his bass line, which are absolutely incredible too, but I just want to play that shuffly hi-hat over all these other tracks for the next 30 minutes. And with stems, you can do that. And I do play things for 30 minutes in the background. Like sometimes I, I take, I'm playing a great record, I grab like one, one beat or two, two beats, and there's this rolling bass line, and, and I start putting things on top. And then, you know, if, you could, if you're sitting on my shoulder, you'll see me sometimes. I've got like four things going. I'm like, I'm like fuck, what am I going to take out? Because I've got to put something else in. I only have four channels. I'm like, shit. So I'm, I'm like pulling something out. Oh, can't take that out. Oh, fuck, can't take that out. And then you know, eventually you have to take something out because something's going to run out. Well, you know, but a lot of the time there'll be something really, like I love... You ask my, you know, Johannes, my sound guys, like, we bring these great, crazy monitors with me. Everyone thinks I'm completely deaf, partly, but I love the, 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 the bass. Like, I just, you know, I love being on the dance floor. I don't get that often. I used to tell people when I made Plastic Man tracks, you know, I would love to, like, feel like I could climb into the bass bin. You know, once we had this after party in um, Ministry of Sound, it was amazing. Ministry of Sound is this great club in... Uh, London, massive bass bins, and you know, for 1,000 people. And we went there with the owner on a Sunday night with eight of us. And uh, Carl Craig was playing music, and we we're all running around the club by ourselves, climbing in and out of the bass bins. And we lost one of our friends, and, and we found him in the basement asleep like eight hours later. Like, it was a like, that's the kind of shit that's inspiring. <laughs> Maybe we could just come in on the sub packet start right here before we give you guys a chance to ask some questions. Oh. You know, I'm traveling a lot, so how do I listen to music? How do you get a grasp of back to why I love bass? Like, how, how can I know what I'm going to play if I'm listening to it on my, you know, Bose headphones or something? Like, so I, we've got this sub pack here, which is actually really, really cool device. What? Cool. <laughs> um, they make a couple of different things, but basically, you know, you plug your, 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 your sound source in there, and then you still have your headphones, and this becomes basically a tactile sound device and gives you um, a bass response on the back. Uh, it's great for video games, but it's really amazing for uh, traveling musicians and DJs. So the last Plastic Man album, I was like, I wrote most of it next to my kitchen uh, in, in Berlin, and, you know, I've got neighbors on both sides, and, you know, I, I, when it got really late, I would turn the monitors down a little bit and then <laughs> turn, turn this on. And uh, uh, that allowed me to feel the music. And in the summer, when I'm doing th you know, three, four, five gigs a week, and I'm hardly seeing my house, you know, I get to the hotel and get some sleep, maybe, and then put that on the chair, sit there, open my laptop, 
and start listening to demos and promos. And it's actually great. I, I get to, I'm picking better music now, I think. You know, because sometimes you're hearing it without the bass and you play it in the club and it was like, oh, why is that kick like that? I thought it was like this, you know? So anyway, it's something, you know, you got to feel music, I think. You know, like we're talking about dance music. If it doesn't have like some kind of balls, like who's going to dance to it anyway? Whatever. <laughs> so it's like, it's like falling asleep in a basement where not be. That is like falling asleep in the basement. <laughs> we are approaching time anyway, so it was a comment you made. Um, I was actually quite nice back in the day when your only role was to make people dance because no one was coming for you. As a DJ, maybe they're coming for you as a DJ, but they won't come for you as a name or as a producer. Yeah. Do you miss do you miss anonymity in DJ? Well, you know, I, I didn't get into DJing to get up on a stage in front of people. Like, <laughs> I was, you know, introverted and 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 shy, and I love. It was like, oh, the DJ booth is in the corner. Nobody really cared that much, you know. Of course, when it was really good, people like went over and said, hey, great set. Um, but it was, uh, I think, a lot of electronic music musicians and DJs especially um, the earlier ones are, are, are pretty shy and introverted people, you know. Um, you know, we didn't expect this massive explosion. And I remember playing some of the big gigs early on, you know, for 1,000 people or 2,000 people. And I was like, you know, so incredibly nervous. And it took really years to get, to get used to that. And um, I feel pretty... Well, really, really, really lucky to get up there and, you know, kind of fuck around and, and do my thing. And and um, when I'm on, when I'm on it, that we, we're all having the time of our lives. And even if I'm not completely on it, I'm doing my thing. And people, I know I'm doing something different. Like I know that I I play different than anyone. Like Chris and I are a little bit similar, but still we play the same record completely differently. And that's. Uh, that's wonderful. That's what the art form of DJing is. You know, some people, you know, we know it, but not everybody understands the art form of, of what a DJ or electronic musician is. Some people still don't think we are musicians or whatever. So to get up there and know you're doing something different and that you're standing for the whole community and standing as a representative of electronic music and this art form, that's pretty fucking cool. Yeah, that expectation from the crowd and the, and the pressure you put on yourself it inspires you to innovate as well. But that's at the heart of electronic music and techno. You know, like, it's, you know, all this is moving forward and, and, and it's, it, it's a slippery sl slope because it shouldn't just be innovative to be innovative or, like, you shouldn't just use new stuff because it's there. You, you, you still have to find yourself and, and find your own way to kind of shine through the machines. But um, if I can hear anything from... DJs or electronic musicians is, is spontaneity in, in it coming through. It can be on a recording, it can be at, at the club, but like, man, I, I hear Jeff Mills. You know, you hear, you know, even, like, I, I, I know how Jeff, he's like, doing all this crazy shit. And even if you don't see that, when you hear it, you can, you can feel that energy. You know, you can feel him. And, 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 and that's the, you know, when I, when I have a great experience of, of playing, I feel that I'm just, it, this is just disappearing and people, it's like they're getting a real idea of who I am and what, what, what I like. Oh, I'm awesome. So please give it up for Richie Hawthorne. <laughs>